شفاء لروحي وحبل المتين ورحمات قلبي وحصن الحصين شفاء لروحي وحبل المتين ورحمات قلبي وحصن الحصين وأمن حياتي وخير الدليل إذا تهت يوم السماوات والأرض وجعل الظلمات والنور ثم الذين كفروا بربهم يعبدون الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله فاطر السماوات والأرض جاعل الملائكة رسلا أولي أجنحة مثنى وثلاث ورباع يزيد في الخلق ما يشاء إن الله على كل شيء قدير أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وعظيمنا وقرة أعيننا محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل ربه حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما نافعا وعملا متقبلا يا كريم وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today we're looking in شاء الله بإذن الله في عون الله تعالى We're going to look at some of the meanings of Surah Al-Nasr Surah Al-Nasr This is one of the shortest surahs of the Quran and it's unique in that it is the last complete surah to be revealed. The last complete surah to be revealed. When we look at, at facts and figures about the Quran, we all, we're all aware that the first verses that we revealed were um, the first five verses of Surah Al-Alaq, And there's a general theme, the Quran was revealed five verses at the time. But the first complete surah that was revealed was Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha is the first complete surah that was revealed. When we look at the very last verses to be revealed in the Quran, although people, people commonly assume, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم, that's not the last verses that were revealed. But the very last verse that was revealed in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمَ تَرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ Fear the day when you return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then each, each soul will taste what is earned, and no one will be wrong. It's in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 281, the very last verse revealed in the Quran. The very last complete surah revealed in the Quran is Surah Al-Nasr, what we're about to do today. So Surah Al-Fatiha is the very first complete surah revealed. Surah Al-Nasr, Ida Ja'a Nasrullah Al-Fatiha is the very, very last complete surah to be revealed, revealed to the Prophet And although they differ exactly when it was revealed, there are those who consider it to be revealed 60 or 70 days before the Prophet passed away. Two months or two months, ten days before the Prophet passed away. Because the last verses that were revealed in the Quran were revealed seven days, some say nine days, some say eleven days before he وسلم, passed away. Only a week before he passed away was the very last verses of the Qur'an that were revealed. Which also helps us to understand something that seems strange. Why would, this, why would the numbers of Sahaba who memorized the Qur'an were only considered relatively long when the Prophet passed away? No more than 23 Hufaz of the Qur'an amongst the Sahaba. No more than 23 would memorize the entirety of the Qur'an. Although they were people with phenomenal memories, it wasn't difficult for them to memorize anything. Part of the reason is how the Prophet gave them the Quran. He didn't give them, like, we just rattle her off, sit, stick a child in a mosque, and in a year or so he's got the Quran. That's not how the Prophet gave them the Quran. He gave them the Quran with Iman and Amal. And he gave them the Quran, and with the Quran, he gave them faith. With the Quran, he gave them understanding. With the Quran, he gave them application. And only when they, when, only when they completely taken on board the Qur'an in those verses in entirety, only then would he give them extra verses. It was a process in, in how they received the Qur'an. So it's not surprising, but he also explained one of the reasons why it's so relative, although it's still a large number, 23 is still large. But we understand because it was so late, before it, it was so late, 23 years minus a week before the whole Qur'an is complete. 
which is why after he passes away, the numbers significantly increase. The numbers significantly increase in terms of the father of the Also, another factor why is it a relative, when we look at hundreds of thousands of Sahaba, the vast majority of them accepted after Fetch Mecca. After Fetch Mecca, the numbers, the numbers explode with the Sahaba after the final conquest, which, which is what we're going to talk which is what we're going to touch upon. So I quote to some 60 days or two months, some say 70 days before the Prophet some passes away. Surah al Nasr was revealed. Others indicate it was before the Fetch of Mecca, before the conquest of Mecca. So there's a difference exactly when it was revealed. And that difference also gives, um, uh, it gives an insight into the Surah. If it was revealed before the conquest of Mecca, which took place two years before the Prophet passes away, then it's foretelling a future event. Zajah and Nasrullah will Fetch. And when the when the help of God comes and the victory comes, and the victory was always understood to be the victory at the conquest of Mecca, it's, having, uh, it's foretelling the future event if it was revealed before the conquest of Mecca. If it comes after the conquest of Mecca, then it's not foretelling an event, it's telling not something that, that has just happened. So Surah Al-Nasr, the last complete Surah that was revealed in the Qur'an. And, and again, and when we look at just Amma, the last the last 30th of the Qur'an, although the overwhelming majority of the surahs that were revealed come or were revealed in, in Mecca, because the general theme of the surahs in Mecca is about placing faith into the heart of those new believers. It's about, it's about embedding faith into the hearts, 13 years of, of fixing faith into the heart, which is why the nature of them is short, poetic, rhythmic surahs that really impact upon. So the vast majority of the last 30th of the Qur'an is revealed in Mecca, with a few exceptions to that amongst them is Surah Al-Nasr. Amongst them is Surah Al-Nasr, but virtually everything else, and also the other exception is Mu'awwidatayn, and Falaq al-Nas, they were revealed in Medina. Surah Al-Nasr, Falaq al-Nas are revealed in Medina. Virtually everything else in, Surah, in the 30th, in the last 30th of the Qur'an is revealed in Mecca. We also looked at interconnection between surahs, Surat al kafirun Surat al-Ikhlas, we spoke about this last time. <coughs> Surat al kafirun Surat al-Ikhlas are tied in together. Tied in together. Surat al kafirun is La ilaha. Al-Ikhlas is illallah. Surat al kafirun is Nafi. And whatever you believe, we're not going to believe that. La a'budu ma ta'am. I'm not worshipping what you worship. You're not going to worship what I worship. I will not, I've never worshipped what you worship. You. You will not worship what I worship. You have your religion, we have our, I have my religion. So it's complete negation of, um, or it's complete rejection of anything other than, or, or all, that, um, all that everybody else worships, complete rejection of it. Um, so, so we can see Surah al kafirun is the first part of the Shahada, La ilaha, we're negating any gods. Where's illallah from? Qul hu Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. And that's why, and he mentioned Surah Al-Kafirun, look at Surah Al-Kafirun. Lord Al-Jalala is not mentioned in Surah Al-Kafirun. The Divine Name is not mentioned in Surah Al-Kafirun. It's just rejection. And we've got nothing to do with your faith. But the very first, the very, the very beginning of Surah Al-Ikhlas, Hu Allah. Hu Allah. It confirms that this is, this is our belief. So that's why we say, La ilaha illallah. It's confirmed. And then it goes on to describe. And we also mentioned before, that's why we see a regular Sunday of the Prophet in prayer. Surah Kafirun, Surah Ikhlas, Surah Kafirun, Surah Ikhlas. Common, common sum of the Prophet, and perhaps the most important which we should all try and implement. There's two sunnahs of Fajr. Two sunnahs of Fajr. It was a normal practice of the Prophet to begin the morning. The very first two rakahs of prayer in the morning, he begin with Kafirun and Ikhlas. Surah Kafirun, Surah Ikhlas. First rakah of the sunnah of Fajr, Surah Kafirun. Second rakah, Surah Ikhlas. Sometimes he said, Allah can also do that in Maghrib prayer, the father of Maghrib. It was a common thing that the Prophet recited these two surahs together. But then we touch upon this, look at what comes in between. Look at what comes in between. And you negate. And this now we see the tartib of the Quran, the sequence of the Quran, and how the Quran miraculously interconnects. So you've got these two surahs, the La ilaha illallah. What's in between? Two surahs in between. What are the two surahs in between? Kafirun is absolute negation of kufr. What happens when you do that? What happens when you do that? There's two possibilities. The, post, the way of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the way of all believers, is that once you reject faith, be ready for the consequences. 
or want to reject kufr and be ready for consequences. If you're firm in your rejection, and inshallah, I think it's next month's video, we're going to speak about Surat al kafirun When you see how that happened, it wasn't the norm of the Prophet. Like now, we've got an <laughs> old call of people kafir, 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 Muslims are non Muslims. In Mecca, Allah the Prophet does not address them as kafir, He does not address them in that way. And particularly when you see the da'wah of, of the prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sayyidina Musa and Sayyidina Harun alayhi salam, when they go to Pharaoh, the arch enemy of God Almighty, speak to him in a gentle manner. Speak to him in a gentle manner. So it's not, it's not, it's not in conform, or it doesn't match up to the character of the Prophet that he's going to go to him and say, Ya ayyuhul kafirun. That doesn't, that doesn't fit in the prophetic, the prophetic way. Which is also why some of them mention why Allah spent time to say Qul. He tells them to say Qul. Right, it's not you who's saying it, it's I'm who's saying it. Right, attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not the messenger who's calling them kafir. Allah subhanahu is the one who's calling them kafir. But when you actually read the seerah how he does it. Because they wanted to negotiate with him. That you will worship your God for a year and you worship our God for a year. <coughs> and then and when the Prophet should instantly rejects it. They try and uh, meet a compromise. And at least come and respect our gods. Cross him, he doesn't say anything. Revelation comes down at that point. Absolutely no compromise in faith. Absolutely no compromise whatsoever in faith. But that harsh language now in the, in the see it mentioned of the cross him because the, the leaders used to, used, to, used to spend time, they used to sit off at the Kaaba, having their gatherings and so on. Cross him goes into the very midst of them, doesn't hold back. And he tells it as he's been told to say it. Because it's Amr Ilahi, it's the divine order. Qul ya al kafirun. When you speak as forcefully as that, you say after that surah is revealed to the kafirun, uh, the kuffar, of, the unbelievers of Mecca, they gave up hope that he will ever back down. They lost all hope of the Prophet backing down at that point. Well, which means what? They intensified their persecution. They increased their persecution. Once they realized he's not going to back down, they increase their attacks on him, they increase their, per their persecution, and that's the nature of absolute denial and rejection of kufr. You accept, you expect what's, what's to come after. You expect what's to come after. Surat al Kafirun is revealed early in Mecca, no more than three, four years after the Prophet's mission began in Mecca. Surat al Nasr is revealed very late after, almost 20 years in between revelation of the two surahs. Almost 20 years in between revelation of the two surahs. Surah al kafir is at the very beginning at Mecca. Surah al nasr is at the very end in Medina. All in sequence, the one after the other. Kafirun and then Nasr. But in actual revelation, almost 20 years separates them. What's that telling the message? So much more believers that come after. That by nature of your denial of kufr, you must face persecution. You must face oppression or you will face difficulty. But you have to go through that. You have to go through that. And if you persevere through all of that difficulty you'll face, then the Nasr and the Fetish will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the, then the openings will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Openings do not come easily from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the way of the religion, the way of faith, inna sabr, inna nasr ma'as sabr. That openings and victory only comes with patience and perseverance. You will always, that anybody who, who holds the banner of the messenger, Sumayasam, High will always face opposition. Just by the very nature, if you're going to walk in his steps, if you're going to walk on his way, you will you will by definition face opposition. But eventually the opening will come, eventually the victory will come. It'll come maybe twenty years later. It's not it's not necessary instant. It may come a long time after. But you can't expect to make profession of faith and instantly everything's going to change. Instantly everything's going to change. The struggle begins when you make those professions. The struggles begin. It can't just be a phase that you go through and expect that. Uh, the heavens will open up and everything will suddenly be a path of roses and suddenly everything will, will just fall into place. Now, the moment the prospects made a public profession, it got harder and harder. And he had to go through that with his companions for 13 years. And he went through a lot of difficulty. He lost his beloved wife. He lost his uncle, who the, who the main support for him, who the main worldly support, to the point where he was taken into the heavens. 
on the on the blessed night journey of Al Mi'raj to receive that solace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to receive that comfort. And then eventually he has to leave, and when he leaves, when he migrates from Mecca to Medina, they still don't leave him. Badr comes and Uhud, then the whole of the all of the armies of all of the armies of Arabia come and surround to the point where Badagatil Qulub al Hanadir, their hearts were at their throats. This is Sahaba talking. In Badr, the Sahaba are calling out, Mata Nasrullah, when will the when will the help of God come? In Uhud, difficulty, a shuhada, martyrs, his own uncle Hamza is 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 killed and mutilated in front of him. To the point where he makes statements that are completely, completely against his nature, where he swears that he will take revenge and he will mutilate 70 of them as, as his uncle has been mutilated. And then Khandaq comes. At that point, Allah says the believers were tested. And they're shaken the most severest of manner. So even years and years passing in Medina, they've got their own stronghold. Still doesn't let up, still doesn't ease up. The, the final Nasr hasn't yet come, the final Fatah hasn't come. Then it starts changing, then you get Sulh al and you start, events start changing until the final point where it comes. But it's almost 20 years later. They had to go through all of that in order for the Fatah, the final opening to come. Even though the Fatah of Mecca was the ultimate victory that the Prophet was yearning for. But it still it had to go through all of that. He had to leave his city before coming back to his own to, to, to his own city. So what that shows is when you profess faith in such a forceful manner, in such a forceful manner, you must and you will face opposition. You must and you will face opposition, you'll face difficulties in your life. And victory won't come immediately. Change won't necessarily come immediately. You're practicing your religion three years, four years, five years. Why haven't things changed? Why haven't things changed? You hear people say, I've been on my religion, I've been praying, I've been making dua all this time, it's still nothing. But keep on going. Keep on going. Ten years later, keep on going. Twenty years later, keep on going. Doesn't matter if your if your Lord decides not to give you fetter, keep on going. He's your Lord, you worship him irrespective. He's your Lord, you worship him. If your Lord never accepts a single one of your du'as, keep on making du'a to him. Keep on praying to him. Because you believe he's your Lord. Your business, your job is to pray, supplicate. Let him answer if he wants to. Let him answer if he wants to. It's not your job to start, start, start the demanding that why haven't the answers come? Why haven't the answers come? Keep on praying. Keep on doing your dhikr. Keep on struggling with your nest. Keep on making du'a. If Allah subhanahu wa wants to answer, that's his business. If he chooses not to answer, that's his business. You keep on making du'a for Palestine, it doesn't get any easier. You're not going to stop making du'a. You're not going to say, what's the point of making du'a? Because he's your Lord. Because he's your Lord. He's Rab and you are Ab. He's Lord and you are slave. So eventually the Nasr will come, eventually the Fatih will come, whatever, whatever the situ situation may be, even if it's a personal issue that a person goes through, a difficulty that is going through, persevere. You persevere, then eventually the fetch will come. So although it comes, Surah Al-Kafirun, Surah Al-Nasr side by side shows you what? The inevitable nature, the inevitable nature of the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming. It will come. It will come. But then Surah Al-Masr that we spoke about shows you how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with those who stand against, those who stand against the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Surah Al-Nasr In Surah Al-Nasr when we look at um, Surah Al-Nasr إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Most of the Mufassirin here amongst the, amongst the most of the scholars of the Quran say that the Nasr in the first instance the word Nasr يَنْصُرُ means to support to give help to strengthen support to give help to strengthen. The Nasr is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nasr is Allah ta'ala. In the real sense, in the absolute sense, the Nusra only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The real help and victory only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else is just ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for it to get to you. But in the real sense, a Nasr is Allah ta'ala. What's the Fatih? 
So the Nasr here, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ When the Nasr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, when the Nasr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, what's the Nasr that's spoken, what's the, what's the help and support that we've been referred to? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helping the Messenger sallallahu supporting the Messenger sallallahu That's how Imam Qadari rahimullah will be mentioning. But here we have an issue. Here we have an issue now about this. Wasn't the, didn't the Prophet always receive help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Didn't he always receive? In Mecca was he in a state of weakness? No. It will seem that way. But he sallallahu never left Mecca until the order came. He didn't run. He did not flee. He migrated out of choice. If it was, if it was problems that he was facing, he would have left a lot earlier than that. But he didn't leave. He was never weak. The Messenger sallallahu was never weak. He was never defeated. He was never defeated. They may well have attacked him at Ba'if. The real strength is the way that he responded. The way that he responded, that he refused to turn his wrath or the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. That's the real strength of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet sallallahu was always Mansur. He was always receiving the Nusra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even when he migrated, he was receiving the Nusra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was receiving divine help. I look at what happened to Ghali Thawb. Isn't that Mansoor? They're standing overlooking the cave and they still can't see him. They still can't see him. A bird comes, a pigeon comes to help him. A spider comes to help him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows him with all of your weapons, with all of your strength. All it took was a pigeon and a spider to protect his messenger. He didn't need everything. That's Mansoor. That's Mansoor. That's not somebody who's weak. They may have been pursuing him. All it took was a spider and a pigeon for Allah subhanahu to divert him. To divert him away from the messenger. The simplest of things it took for Allah subhanahu to protect his messenger. And that's why at the very end in Tawbah, in Surah Tawbah, we said Surah Tawbah is one of the latter surahs to be revealed in Medina. When Allah subhanahu in the Quran speaks about the instance of the Hijrah, well, he says, لا تحزن إن الله معنا. Uh, when he speaks about Abu Bakr as Siddiq along with the Prophet in Ghari Thawr, in the cave of Thawr. In the cave of Thawr. When is Surah Tawbah revealed? Very late. What's the ayah? The, the verses of Hijrah in the Quran come in Surah Tawbah. They come almost like eight, nine years after the Hijrah. A long time after. And but Allah Subhanahu begins the ayah by saying, if you don't support him, Allah has already supported him. If you don't help the Messenger, Allah has already granted help to the Messenger. When? When he had to leave. When he had to leave Mecca. So here, when you look at the ayah in Surah Tawbah, Surah Tawbah about the, the Hijrah, about the incident in the cave of Hari Hira, it comes way long, long after the Hijrah itself. It's revealed long after, years after the Hijrah. The Prophet, Allah SWT is reminding the believers now in Medina um, who, who have been required now to go out and fight the Jihad. And they find it, some of them finding it difficult to go out in the last expedition. Allah SWT is reminding if you don't help him, Allah SWT is the one who already helped him. You're just Asbab, you're just means. He just needed a pigeon and a spider to help his messenger. It doesn't take a lot for Allah SWT to help his messenger. The real help is that you're doing this for yourself by you standing by the messenger so much. So. so the Prophet was never weakened. He was never weakened. He was never uh, he was never defeated because he was Mansur min Allah ta'ala. So what so here the point is what then does it mean is that Jah Nasrullah? Because the Nasr of Allah was always coming to the Messenger so much. So. Uh, when the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, Wal Fatih, what's the Fatih? The Fatih is Fatih Mecca, that's what Ibn Abbas said. The Fatih and the conquest or the opening, i.e., the conquest or the opening of Mecca. Although the Prophet was always supported, and he was always receiving, receiving openings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the real support and the real opening that the Prophet always yearned for was to conquer his own hometown was the conquest of his hometown. And that's the real Nasr that Allah speaks about. Where he's able now, after 20 years of opposition, 
from his own people to go back victorious, to go back to his own people victorious. And here we see part of uh, the nature of the Prophet And for almost 20 years now he's been giving da'wah, calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And something inside the Prophet troubled him, which was what? That everybody's accepting except for his own people. Everybody's accepting except for his own people. His own people, his own, his own qabila, his own tribe. In Mecca, his hometown. Beloved town to him. Beloved town. When he leaves Mecca, he stands on a plateau overlooking Mecca. He turns back and says to Mecca, addressing his own town, that you are the most beloved town on the face of the earth to me. And if my people had not made me leave, I would never have left. So what trouble the messenger so likes him? All of Arabia is accepting except, except for my own people. You're going out doing that one, everybody's accepting except for your own family. Except for your own family. Except for those closest to you. It will affect, it will affect you. But the real Nasr of the Prophet was looking for, the real Fatah he was looking for was his own people. His own people. Because that one begins at home. The call to Allah subhanahu begins at home. The call to Allah subhanahu begins with those closest to you. Allah subhanahu says, save yourself and your families from hell. Save yourself and your family from hell. So the real Nasr and the real Fatah, the real opening and the real victory that the Messenger was looking for was the conquest of Mecca itself. Either the students of Arabic, students of Arabic, either is mitahakkuq al wuku. You have a difference between in and either. In means if, possibility. Possibility may happen, possibility may not happen. In ja'a zaydun fa akhrim. If zayd comes, it's possible he won't come. Or either is with the haqqaq al means it's definitely happening. When? That's not if, that's when. So when Allah subhanahu if we take this as being revealed before Fatih Mecca, Allah subhanahu is giving the Messenger of some guarantee that you will enter into Mecca. You will enter into Mecca, you will be victorious. We should also tie this, if you look at it as being from before, we should also tie this into other surahs of Quran. We have two surahs in the 26th. 26 juz of the Qur'an we have, we have a collection of surahs, a series of surahs called the Hawameen the surahs that begin with Hameen the Hameen surahs, all of them look at all of them in different ways looks, looks at the relationship between the slave and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all of you look at the sequence of Hameen surahs all of them in one way or another is looking at you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the Hameen surahs, the last of them surahs, the Lahqaf Followed by what? Followed by Surah ayyoh, ayyoh, Followed by Surah Al-Fatih Followed by Surah Muhammad And then after that comes Surah Al-Fatih After that comes Surah Al-Fatih In that sequence In that sequence It shows you something that in terms of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He is the Fatih. That He is the opening. In order for you to have that relationship, you've got to go to Muhammad by which you get the Fatih that comes that comes after that. But then Surah Al Hujurat comes after that. And what Surah Al Hujurat tell you about? Adab with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Surah Al Hujurat begins, do not step ahead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Messenger. Do not raise your voices in the presence of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What's that telling you? That in order to, for you to have a connection to Allah subhanahu through the Messenger sallallahu by which you receive the fatih, what must happen? That you have adab with the Messenger sallallahu You cannot have that connection with Allah subhanahu through the Messenger sallallahu unless you maintain those etiquettes with, Allah, with, the, with the Messenger sallallahu So Surah Al-Nasr and Surah Al-Fatih, if you tie them to what happened before, Surah Hudaybiya, the peace treaty of Hudaybiya comes, Prophet before that sort of vision, sort of vision, he saw a dream, he sees a dream of him entering into Mecca, performing Umrah, performing Umrah. And the dreams of prophets, the dreams of prophets are wahi. Our dreams can be mistaken. Never the dream of prophet, the, the dream of prophet will never be mistaken. It will always come to pass. So he tells him to go. Initially, the unbelievers in Mecca, they refuse to allow it to happen. They refuse to allow it to happen. So they come out and meet him, and eventually they come to an agreement. 
Sul Hudaybia, the peace treaty of Hudaybia, where the terms of the agreements are difficult for the believers. It seems as if it's a it seems as if it's a loss, particularly saying that Umar al has major issues with the with the conditions of the peace treaty. But eventually Surat al Fatih comes. Surat al Fatih is revealed to show that that's an opening, that's a, that's a victory. And the Prophet told him that we will enter into Mecca. We will enter into Mecca. Did you not tell us, Sayyidina Umar al-Bahn says, did you not tell us that we'll enter into Mecca? He said, did I tell you this year? He said, no. He said, we will enter into Mecca. We will enter into Mecca. So they come back the year after, stronger. And when Satan, and when Abu Sufyan sees the armies, it troubles him. And he sees the power now of the Prophet it troubles him. But it's all now building up to the eventual conquest of Mecca. All building up to the eventual conquest of Mecca. After two years of the peace treaty, the Meccans break the, or the allies of Meccans break the terms of the peace treaty. They break the terms of the peace treaty. At that point, the Prophet orders them now that we're marching on Mecca. And he orders the Sahaba to get ready. Abu Sufyan realizes what happened. He comes begging the Messenger Sallallahu to hold to the peace treaty, but it's been broken. And now the time comes to move. Now the time comes to move. The armies of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi towards Mecca. They encamp, they encamp outside of Mecca, in, in, in distance of Mecca. And Abu Sufyan, who is the last leading opponent of the Messenger Sallallahu will eventually take Shahada, will eventually take Shahada, Abu Sufyan. He eventually becomes Sahabi. Although from Mu'allafat al although from those who became Muslim due to force of events, <coughs> the sheer weight or the sheer power now that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi he has no other option but to now at this point. When he sees the numbers, he realizes that Mecca is now hopeless. He realizes that the whole thing is sent completely against. He realizes now that the final victory is coming to the Messenger Sallallahu after all those 20 years. And that's exactly as Allah Subhanahu had promised. It's inevitable that it will come. The, the, the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the victory will come to the Prophet sallallahu Then we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala men mentions and then eventually the, the Nasr comes, or then the, the Prophet enters in from all sides of from all sides of Mecca, and sending the armies in, instructing them not to kill anybody, not to raise a sword against anybody. From one side of Mecca, Sayyidina Khalid bin Walid, the one who's leading leading soldiers coming into Mecca, they attack, they attack, they defend themselves, and in the process of doing so, around twenty people are killed, and they're the only people who are killed in the conquest of Mecca. Only, only, and, and here, reflect <coughs> over the rahim of the Prophet ﷺ. Reflect over the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ. Towards the people who had hounded him, persecuted him, driven him out. The natural thing is revenge. The natural thing is vengeance. And that's what was going through Abu Sufyan's mind. Mecca is helpless now, they can't do anything. He brought the whole of Arabia against, they can't do anything. But it's not in the nature of the Messenger Sallallahu He has no evil within him, he has no malice within him, he has no hatred within him. Purified, completely purified. Created as a pure, as a pure, as the purest soul. <coughs> so the whole of Arabia is helpless in front of him. The whole of Mecca is helpless in front of him. He forgives every single one, with the exception of ten. Ten, who are the most harshest, severest in their language against the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Every other one, he forgives them. He goes into Mecca. The whole city is completely helpless now in front of him. He sends out, he sends out as he now goes into into the Haram of Mecca, surrounded by 360 idols that have been pinned down, bolts bolted down from pre from pre-Islam, bolted down by devils, shayateen, bolted down the devils around the Kaaba. And that was one of the miracles of the birth of the Prophet. These idols that were bolted down at the birth of the Prophet, they collapsed. They collapsed. The bolts couldn't hold them down. But they were erected back again, surrounded by these idols, which had been introduced into, um, into Mecca. Prophet sends out, sends, sends out a word that anybody who takes sanctuary, security, 
in the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. Anybody who remains in his own house is safe. Anybody who takes sanctuary inside of the Kaaba or inside around the Haram Mecca is safe. The whole of Mecca is now helpless in front of him. He now goes to the Mecca, or they all now come out to him and say, What will you do to us? They say, What will you do to us? They ask you, What do you think I am? They say, They say, Karimun, Akhun Karim, Ibn Akhin Karim, that you're a noble brother. That's it, right? said, you're a noble brother, the son of a noble brother. What do you think I will do to you? What do you think I will do to you? I know you are a noble brother, the son of a noble brother. He says, I say to you what Joseph said to his brothers, Ali I say to you what Yusuf said to his brothers. There is no revenge today. There's no revenge today, you're all forgiven. May God forgive you, oh, he's the most forgiving, most merciful. But think about the think about the karam of the messenger, so much then. Like someone who's done that to you for 20 years, driven you out of your home, persecuted you, hounded you, sent out armies against you, and at the end of all of it, you say, I forgive you. I forgive you. That's not normal human behavior. That's not normal. Nobody would do such a thing. Nobody would do such a thing, except for a prophet like Yusuf Ali Sam, except for our messenger, so much. Somebody who does that to you from your own family causes all of that problem. Most people are not willing to forgive. Most people will not forgive. We've got families who don't talk for years and years because of, because of matters are far, far more trivial than this. Far, far more trivial than this. Over like kind of part of land, somebody won't speak for years and years. They won't speak to you for years. Proselytes for something far, far more severe than forgiving everything. Doesn't hold anything whatsoever. No grudge with it. No ill feeling. No manners whatsoever with it. Whatever it is, it's, a, it's gone. It was never there in the first place with the messenger. So much for it to go. That's the karam of the messenger. So much. That's the, that's the real khuluq of the messenger. So much. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتِحِ When the nasr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes in the open, we all need Nasr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It happened to the Prophet in Mecca. We all need Nasr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all need Nasr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all go through our personal struggles in our life. We go through most important our spiritual struggles with our nafs. With our nafs. Our nafs, for, mo for most people the nafs is not, is not maghluba, it's ghalida. The nafs dominates people. Person's soul and his ego dominates. Person's soul and ego controls. A person's soul and ego takes a person whichever way that, that, that it wants to take them. Because for most people, the soul is a lowly creature. It needs taming, needs bringing under control. But if you look at the ruh, the soul itself, the nature of the ruh, the soul, is that the, the ruh is otherworldly, it's not from this world. The soul is not from this world, it's not from, it's not from earth, the body is from earth, the body is from earth. We feed our body with tea and with biscuits and with, with rice and with all, that's what we feed it with. Why? Because the body came from the earth so it's fed with, it's fed with earthly substances. The soul is not from this world, the soul is not from this world, the soul is from, the soul is from Alam and Amr. Or the ruh of Amri Rabbi, it's from the affair of my Lord. Say the soul is from the affair of my Lord. It came from our Lord. When he saw Allah Sumana Layrat al Mi'raj, what did he see in the first heaven? He saw Sayyidina Adam Islam, our father Adam Islam. On his right he saw souls. On the left saw souls. Whenever Sayyidina Adam Islam turned to the right, he would be happy and smile. When he turned to the left, he would start weeping and crying. What is that with your Islam? So on the right are the souls of those who enter into heaven. When he looks, he's happy and smiles. On the left, the souls of those who enter into hellfire. He weeps when he looks at them. Because they're all from his progeny. They're all, they're all his children. That's where the soul came from. The first heaven. The first heaven. A pure, a pure existence. Not polluted by anything. It's then brought into our body and caged. Brought into our body and it's caged inside our, our body. 
The soul is like a prisoner. The body is a cell. The soul is a prisoner inside of the inside the cell that is our body. What does it always yearn for? Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what gives it ease. Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it reminds it of reminds it where it came from. It reminds it of where it came from. That's why when a person is engaged in constant dhikr and Quran and so on, you feel like a lightness within you. Because it's not tied down now by this world. <coughs> it's not tied down by this world. The best way to control, to, to bring it under control, or, or to loosen the, the soul, is to go less with this. The more you take of this world, the heavier it becomes on the soul. The more you take from this world, the heavier it becomes on the soul. But your, our real existence is the soul and not the body. It's the soul and not the body. We are defined by our souls, not by our body. The moment you die, <coughs> death is defined as what? The soul leaving the body and going into another realm of existence. That's what death is. The moment that your, your body leaves, or the soul leaves this body, your body decays. When the space, within the space of a day or two days, it's, not, it's rotted away. It's rotted away. What does that tell you? It's a soul that kept your body alive. It's a soul that kept your body going. The moment the soul's gone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for this to perish immediately. Except for those bodies, except for those bodies that were completely immersed in the part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The bodies of the Anbiya, the bodies of the Awliya and the Shuhada. Their bodies will not perish. To create ikram al to honor those bodies that worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly. That were in a constant state of servitude. That's, that's what our existence is all about. It's that soul within that body. Our soul always needs the nasr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our soul is always yearning for the victory to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When does that fatah come? When you subjugate your soul. When does that fatah come? When you bring your soul under control. The soul that you polluted with sin. The soul that you made filthy with sin. It, by, because of which it becomes blind and it can't see. The soul becomes blind. The soul has a sight, just as the body has a sight. Al-Basr, lil The soul sees, just as the eyes see. But for many of us, we can't see anything. It's a worrying sign. The fact that we can't see anything indicates that our soul has become blinded. Our soul has become blinded. And that's what, in Arabic, they'll refer to Al-Ama and Al-Ama. 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 Is blindness of the eyes. Al-Ama is blindness of the heart. People, ghiyanihim yahmahum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the unbelievers. La'amruka innahum lafi sakratihim yahmahum. Allah subhanahu wa swears by the life of the Messenger. That they, the unbelievers, are drunk in their blindness. What's the, what's the real blindness? Not this, that. The fact that we can't sense anything, we can't see anything beyond our existence indicates that we've completely suffocated and choked our souls. Our souls are spiritually dead. Our souls are spiritually dead. It needs nasr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It needs, it needs help and victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why when you keep on struggling, you keep on struggling, what's the, what's the, two, the two most important things to receive that victory and openings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is salah and dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prayer, particularly prayer in jama'ah, Particularly prayer in Jama'ah. The soul of believers feeds off the souls of other believers. Feeds off the souls of other believers. When you buy yourself a home, sat in front of the box and so on, you zap away. Any, any iman that was left in you is getting zapped off by that box. It's getting completely killed off. When you sat around, you may be doing nothing except for just that contact with souls that are purified. Contact with goodly souls. That has an effect. That has an effect on each other. So salah is very important. It's the fundamental. The fundamental to bring life back into it. But then what, what, in, what, what nourishes the soul is dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qut al qulub. That's the, that's the nourishment, that's the provision of soul. So you want nasr and fatih from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Struggle with your prayer. Struggle with your dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as happened with the Prophet it took 20 years for that victory to come. The physical victory of the Prophet was in this way conquest of Mecca came, it took 20 years. So we struggle, we struggle with our souls. We struggle through our daily routines. 
I will be with them. Just hold on to prayer and hold on to the gift of the Lord. Just thank God. As long as those two things are in place, it may well take 10, 20 years, but the fetish will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually. And then it says, وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا And you'll see people entering into the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala أَفْوَاجًا Jama'at in large numbers, in groups and groups, in large numbers, they will enter into the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One one of the observations in Sirah that the Mufassir make about this ayah, who is the nas that's being referred to? In the first instance, Qada'il al Arab was the Arabian tribes across the peninsula. You know, you, you know in Syria that the year after the conquest of Mecca is known as Am al Wufud. It's the year of delegations. The tribes after tribes kept on coming. Proselytes and receiving them, tribes and tribes just kept on coming day after day, accepting Islam. Accepting Islam. Am al Wufud. The delegations were coming and coming to accept Islam. Why did, why, did, why did they all wait so long? Why at the very end? So one of the reasons they said is that the struggle between the proselytes and the Quraysh, the rest of Arabia, most of the rest of Arabia viewed it almost as a localized struggle between Ahl al-Hijaz, Ahl al-Hijaz, the people of Mecca drove out one of their own, he goes and takes refuge with Medina, he comes back. So it's just, for, mo for many of them viewed it as an internalized, localized struggle taking place. With amongst the Quraysh. But then they will add to that. Most of them didn't participate after, particularly other than, other, other than Ahzab, the, the confederation. They, they left it as a localized struggle taking place. But then as soon as Fatih Mecca took place, they all came in their hordes and accepted. It's as if the people of Arabia, what was fresh in their minds of the people within, within the lifetime, Am al Feed, Am al Feed, the incident where Allah subhanahu wa dealt with Abraham and the elephants. Abraham and the elephants. And it's as if they took a lesson from that. That anybody who comes and attacks Mecca, even though they may well be helpless, Rabb al Ka'bah will deal with the Ka'bah. The Lord of Mecca and the Lord of Ka'bah will deal with it. Doesn't need anybody there. And they all leave. A famous Abdul Muttalib. He said, "I'm the Lord of these camels, and the Lord of the house of its, and the house of its own Lord will take care of it, and the Lord of the house takes care of the house." That's fresh in their memory. It's within the lifetime of the people, uh, in, in the year of the birth of the Messenger, So that's less than that's 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 almost sixty years back. So it's as if Arabia was waiting to see the outcome of what was going to happen, and for many. If he enters in contact and, and conquers without any divine repercussions, it means he's from God. It means he's from God. Because if he's not from God, God Almighty already took care of somebody else who came and tried to damage them. Tried to damage them. Allah Subhanahu took care of them. So that's why many of them started entering. They were waiting for the final. Like if, he was from, if he was not from God, Allah Subhanahu would have taken care of them. But the fact that he comes in and nothing happens indicates that the Arabs that he was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it was a seal for many of the Arabian tribes that he was a messenger for, um, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, qadail, qadail Arab. And when you see the people entering into the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in hordes and in... This also tells us another thing for da'wah. Ahl al-da'wah. People who are working on their people. You're in your community. Nobody's listening to you. You may well close doors on you. They will cause you all types of problems. So you didn't bless advice. He saw the lights and takes far less than that. Twenty years, you had so much problems from his people. So you've had, you've not suffered anything yet. Alhamdulillah, right. they've not driven you out of your town yet. Some may well have been driven out of town, but <laughs> not yet. Wait for that to come. They say Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. They mentioned by one of our teachers that he wants to do that in a town and he's stoned driven out beaten by his people then he came back the sheikh he cried when he saw it he asked him why did you cry 
He said, you would send something that Allah subhanahu has never on me to have from the sun of the Prophet. Now so, uh, he's sent away by his people, you know, people beaten by his people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hasn't had that. Many of us don't have that. We, should, we don't seek that out. But if it comes, we say, we join blessed, blessed company in that. Because again, you know, when you look at da'wah, uh, we're, we're going to cry because people around us don't accept, nobody's come to the gatherings and so on. Look at Safina Noah Ali Salam. Look at the Ark of Noah Ali Salam. 950 years. Nabi Allah, or Al Azmi bin Abusul, one of the greatest five prophets. How many were on that? How many were on that Ark with him? How many were on that Ark with him? After almost a millennium of, of da'wah, Allah Taala, less than 100 people on the Ark with him. You keep on working, and then when the Nasr and Fatih will come, you will see, you will see. People actually into the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in force, in, 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 in large numbers. Our responsibility in that was not like, why, are, why isn't everybody accepting our message? I'm trying my best and nobody's listening. So no, no worries. Just keep on doing what you're doing. The outcome comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our responsibility is not to convert people. Our responsibility is not to convert people. Our responsibility is to present present the guide is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu calls us al Hadi, the guides, as we address the Messenger, he says, Well inna ka tahdi la sirati mustaqi. You're the one who guides to the straight path. If he calls us that's just to honor us, but it's the real guide is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can preach for a thousand years and nobody will start out and accept. You still preach. You still preach. You can call forever and nobody comes. You still call. You still call. If Allah SWT decides to give you a fetch and a nasr and da'wah, it's his choice. It's his choice. But if you don't, like when, when the Prophet passes away, the whole of Arabia is at his feet. He's the king, he's the monarch of, of all of Arabia. But there are other prophets that have none of that. Some prophets were, were killed. Some prophets were killed in da'wah of Allah Ta'ala. They tried to kill Prophet Isa and they failed, but they tried to kill him. So if somebody is killed in the path of doubt with Allah, it's a line, says, blessed run to your journey. If you face a lot of hardship and difficulty, it's blessed. It's blessed. Our worry concern should be when it's so, when it's so easy. Because that's not the prophetic, that's not the way of the prophets. The way of doubt with Allah it's not mm-hmm. easy. So you see, what are eight and nasi at Huluna Fidi Mullahi Afwaj? Jabir ibn Abdullah, Sahabi and Jadid, the great companion Jabir ibn Abdullah. He's asked, he asks um, an individual how the people, he said, Alhamdulillah, they're in khayr, they're in afiyah, they're in a good state, they're in a state of well being. He, radiallahu anhu arda, when he hears that answer, he begins to cry and weep. He begins to cry and weep. He asks him, Why do you cry? He said, I heard the Messenger وسلم, say, دَخَلَ النَّاسُ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ وَسَيَخْرُجُونَ مِنْهُ أَفْوَاجَ He said, that I, I heard the Messenger وسلم, say that people have, um, have entered into the, into the religion of God Almighty أَفْوَاجَ in large groups. He said, there will come a time where they will leave in large groups. There will come a time where they will leave in large groups. And Alhamdulillah, he didn't witness that in his time, although the concern was there. They were in a good state, alhamdulillah they were in there, but he was concerned about what was to come. And our concern is that we may well be in those times. Me, that Allah subhanahu wa speaks of people who enter into the religion of Allah in large groups, but the Messenger said there will come a time where people leave in large groups, where people are leaving in large groups. And what's the key to that? When the Nusra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not come. When the Nusra of Allah subhanahu wa does not come. When you abandon Allah subhanahu wa Allah subhanahu wa abandons you and leaves you to the worst of this creation. We'll show no mercy whatsoever to any believer. We'll show no mercy whatsoever to any believer. When does that happen? When do people leave the religion of God in large numbers? When, when Iman has not taken a firm foothold within the hearts of believers. And that's why the Madaris and the Ulama, so on, the most important thing they should embed within the hearts of believers is that Iman with them. If that's not there, people will leave the religion of Allah in large numbers. When you see all of this going on, when the Nasr of Allah comes and the Fatih comes, when you've overcome yourself, 
Well, now you've, you've submitted yourself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What should we do? Sabbih bihamdi rabbika wa stawfir. Sabbih bihamdi rabbika wa stawfir. Three things that I'm mentioning in this earth. Sabbih, hamd, istighfar. Three things. In relation, in response to three. Three in response to three. Nasr, fatih, dukhul. When the, when the Nasr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, support, victory, and people that enter into fold, respond with three. Respond with three. When you see three, respond with three. What are three you respond with? Tasbih, hamd, and istighfar. Tasbih, hamd, and istighfar. When these verses were revealed to the Messenger وسلم, Sayyidah, our mother Sayyidah Um Salam al Banhan said in the last days of the life of the Messenger وسلم, increased in worship more than what he used to do before. Which is difficult for somebody who always used to worship. But if you can imagine somebody who always worship increasing in worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, particularly in the last days of the life of the Messenger وسلم, just in a constant state of thought and the last couple of months of his life, as she she mentioned and she, he said in the last days of life of the Messenger وسلم, where he would stand, sit, walk, whatever he would do, he would say, SubhanAllah, wa bihamdi astaghfirullah. In response to the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sabbih bihamdi rabbika wa astaghfir. Glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his praises and ask us to give his forgiveness. So he would say, SubhanAllah, wa bihamdi astaghfir. So if you overcome your nafs, if you finally won the battle against yourself, subhanAllah wa bihamdi astaghfirullah. And humble yourself in front of Allah, because that's where the nasr, that's where the fatah, and that's where the opening came from. Turn yourself back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned back. Abu Hurair al-Dlan, he mentioned, that just before, after the revelation of this surah, the Prophet increased his worship to the point his feet would swell. That wasn't before. The religious say that Aisha was normally as Ta'ala. He would increase in worship to the point where his feet would swell and crack. But now, just before he passes away, وسلم, because of the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Are you received everything now? You've received everything that you wanted. Your people are now with you, they believe in you. They believe in you, they followed your way. Everything's been opened up for you now. Turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sabbih bihamdi rabbika wa stafir. When you receive all of these openings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what's the danger with openings? The danger with openings is that you go the other way. When you start, when you start to bask and revel in the favor of God Almighty, you forget the, the bestower of the favors. And that's the, the higher rank of the Adi billah ta'ala. People of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they make istighfar because they basked in the favor and they forgot the one who bestowed the favor. They were rejoicing in the favor, but they forgot the one who bestowed the favor. So when he saw Allah, Islam, the ultimate ni'mah that was given in the fetch of Fetch Mecca, the greatest opening for the Prophet was the, the conquest of Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him in that hour, don't forget where it all came from. Don't forget, don't rejoice over the favor, rejoice the one who bestowed that favor upon you. That you've now been struggling with your fajr prayer all those years. Alhamdulillah, you finally conquered it. It's a natural thing with you. you know, you've rejoiced now. You're happy with the fact that Alhamdulillah, I'm always praying now. And I, and I don't lose it. That in of itself is fine. High rank. Rejoice in the one who gave you that. Rejoice in the one who gave you that. And that's why you say, and it, those at the muqarrabeen, those who are at the highest spiritual level, they would make tawbah from acts that we would consider to be virtuous acts. They would repent from acts that we would consider to be virtuous acts. If you and I, alhamdulillah, we never have a difficulty now in the rest of our life with a prayer. We're always happy now with that prayer. Alhamdulillah, we do. That's a blessed thing because you pray. But some of the higher rank, when he looks back on that, thinks that, I was being happy about the prayer. I forgot about the one who bestowed, who gave me that opening. He would make tawbah from that state that you would consider to be virtuous, he would make tawbah from that state. And that's what, that's what they mentioned, the istighfar of the Prophet was. Every single moment he was rising. 
we saw something essential. Every moment before he would make sawbah for you because he's lesser than, than what he's at. He's lesser than what he's at, what he's at which, is, which is one of the explanations of that which comes after is better for you than that which came before. Every moment he's slicing and rising. He's slicing and rising. Even about that he, he's slicing and keeps on rising. So he makes it step far for the states which for us, if only we had those states, if only we can't even imagine having the states that the message is not making the stiff bar for. We can't even imagine having those states with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the moment you have those openings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, humble yourself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't let your spirituality, your religiosity overcome you. And that you start believing that you have rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just humble yourself and be tasbih. Humble yourself and give hand. Tasbih, hand and istighfar with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For all that he saw. Sayyidina Abu Hurairah said, "Ishtahad the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, بعد نزوله حتى تورمت قدماه ونحل جسمه وقل تبسمه." Now, when, when this surah was revealed, the Prophet did so much ijtihad. He devoted himself so much into worship, in worship, to the point where his feet swelled and cracked, his body became thin. وقل تبسم. He rarely smiled, and he wept profusely. The last days of the life of the Messenger. Why did he so much make his tikhar here? Why did he so much make his tikhar? It's a general question. Allah SWT said, What's stuck fifth? What's stuck fifth? Ask forgiveness. Why is he so much asking forgiveness? You can understand tasbih. You can definitely understand hand. The Prophet was Ahmed. The Prophet is Ahmed, his name is Ham, the one who praises Allah Subhanahu all the time, Ahmed al Hamid. He's the greatest of those who praise Allah Subhanahu wa So when you see Tasbih, you can understand that. When you see Ham, you can understand you can understand that. But why is there istighfar within? In relation to this, although we mentioned this before, it's possible that what passes through your thoughts, like Imam Fakhruddin al Ghazi Allah says it's possible. That what passes through the Messenger Sallallahu is thoughts of revenge. It's possible that he recalls it 20 years ago. So Allah Subhanahu wa before that comes into his mind, Salatim, he stops it. Ask forgiveness for the possibility of thinking about thoughts which are not befitting your maqam, which are not befitting your, your lofty rank with Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. This surah also indicated uh, those Sahaba who had a deeper understood, understanding understood that this was the this was the end for the Messenger Sallallahu They understood this to be the final the, to be the final days of the Messenger Sallallahu Mentioned the wife famous in the relation of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khan, you are Abdul ibn Abbas. You used to honor and respect Abdullah ibn Abbas with Lanhu. And he would, the Sayyidina Umar used to have around him the Badriyi, those who fought in the Badr, and these were the most, amongst the most prominent of the Sahaba, because the people of Badr were known amongst the Sahaba. The Prophet said, اعملوا ما شئتم أن فقد غفرت لكم. And the Prophet, Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the people of Badr, do whatever you want because you've been forgiven. Do whatever you want because you've been forgiven. So Sayyidina Umar used to surround around him the people of Badr people of Badr, those who fought in Badr. Some of them had issues with them. As young Ibn Abbas is sitting in our midst. So Sayyidina Umar al one time in order to show. In order to show. And he asked them, what did you understand? إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ وَجِدْ He presents them, what did this surah mean? They all gave explanation, which were valid understandings. They all gave their understanding from it. He goes to Ibn Abbas and says, what do you understand? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet that he's about to leave. He's about to leave this world. Why? Because the ultimate fetah has come for you. That which you yearn for, which is the conquest of Mecca, it's come. There's nothing left after that. There's nothing left after that. And note, that he sallallahu alayhi wa when he leaves this world, all prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when the angel of death comes, he comes as a servant. The angel of death comes as a servant. Angels are servants of the, of the prophets. 
For all of us, the angel of death comes upon us suddenly, but not for the prophets of God. For the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, prophets are always given a choice of when they want to leave. And the angel of death comes to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says, Ishmael shit, Ishmael shit, live as long as you want. Keep company with whoever you want, for inna ka you're going to have to leave him. Live as long as you want. You can choose your point where you leave this earth. You can choose the time where you leave this earth. You can keep company with whoever you want, but you're going to have to leave him. The Prophet when he's given that choice, the wine of the Prophet said, he's not going to choose us. He's not going to choose us. He's not going to, he's not going to choose his day. What's his final words when he did before he leaves it? The last words of the Prophet have uttered, Ar-Rafiq al a Ar-Rafiq al a in the Seerah ibn Hisham, he mentioned the very first words that the Prophet uttered were at the time of Halim al-Sa'adiyya and the very first word he said was Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. The very last words he said, Ar-Rafiq al-A'la. What's Ar-Rafiq al-A'la? The highest echelons. The highest company. And his soul to go and join the ranks of Al-Mala' al-A'la. The, the angels, the highest angels, the angels closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be amongst them discussing the ranks of the believers. Because what do they speak about? They speak about the a'mal, the deeds of believers, what, what deeds take them to Allah. The Prophet is yearning to leave this world so that his soul can go now and be amongst and be amongst the angels of Allah. So when Surah Al-Nasr comes, he chooses to leave. It's the end, his mission is complete. Mecca has been conquered. He's paved the way for us all to believe in him, and then he leaves this world with his mission complete. And he goes into the realm of the dogs. Okay, next, inshallah, next, inshallah, we'll do next um, next month. Inshallah, we'll look at Surah Al-Kafir, which is exactly what we'll do.